Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining this evening. I am Srilekha Pali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in our candidates that are running for primaries so you get to know them better and learn about the issues that you care about and also what they care about. Please note that our 10th district convention is on Saturday, May 21st at various locations. We will talk about it more as we get along or get into the conversations. While these conversations are going on with our guests, feel free to chat with us by putting in your questions in the comment section. I will try to get to as many questions as I possibly can. Continue to support these conversational ses sessions by subscribing to Fairfax GOP page. Now let's get to our candidate for today. It is my honor to introduce Captain Kao. Han Kao is a retired Navy captain who served in special operations for 25 years. He and his wife, April, are the parents of five beautiful children whom they homeschool. After their 13th move across the United States and around the world in the service of our great nation, Hung and April made their home in Purcellville, Virginia, where they have been active in their community and in their church for the last five years. Hung is running for 10th District Congressional uh, as a congressional candidate. Hung, welcome to Conversations That Count. And I'm not only thrilled to have you, but honored to have you. Thank you, Shri. So Hung, as um, I, I was always curious when I hear about immigrants, I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, I have a lot of respect for all the things that, that as we immigrants have to go through. You're a refugee from Vietnam when you started off your journey into the United States and immigrated to this great country shortly before the fall of Saigon. So when Kabul fell, I, I mean, I, I had a very eerily similar feeling about native Saigon because I have tons and tons of Vietnamese friends. I think the looks of leaving hundreds of Americans stranded and abandoning our allies kind of uh, made me think about what went through when Saigon fell. So did all those old memories of Saigon fall, fall came back to you when you saw that happen? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the images of mothers handing babies to Marines just for the hope that their child would survive is just astounding. I mean, it just, it breaks my heart. I mean, I remember there's a lot of my friends who. Um, who, who were handed off to, to, to GIs back in the days, and they never knew who their, their birth parents were. Um, for us, we were fortunate to come over here, but you know, there, it was not without hardship. I mean, my mom had to sew money and, and notes into our clothes saying, this is my child, please take care of them in case we get separated. And even at one point, my parents had to face the, um, the realization that maybe not all the kids can come over. You know, they had five children and People are saying, oh, no, the, the Americans aren't going to let you bring all five. You know, what if you're going to bring two or three? So they had to make decisions of where, which ones to leave behind, who, who's old enough to take care of themselves, who's old enough to, to um, be on their own, and, and how do we come back for them? I mean, my parents couldn't stay because my father was part of the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and high up in the government. So he would be executed or sent to a uh, concentration camp. And so, you know, those are hard decisions for them to, to make in the uh, you know, thank goodness we were able to come over here and this, this amazing country gave us this ladder of opportunity, right? But you still have to climb up yourself. All of us, we all came here as immigrants, but, you know, we didn't expect lifelong handouts. We just wanted that, just a chance to, to do something with our lives. Um, our, our, our place was actually in Africa. My, uh, my father couldn't find any uh, work over here as an agronomist. So we moved to Africa for many years uh, seven years. And then my parents had to make another hard decision because we went to French schools. And so my mom had to bring us back. And then my dad remained in Africa working by himself for the next 15 years, um, you know, and visiting us only every six months. Uh, just, I mean, that's the sacrifices our parents had to make. And it's just all the sacrifices along the life, just for the chance of their kids having, having a, the opportunity for, for freedom and for education. And everyone has said that you have a lot of passion. I see where the passion is coming from. I think when you have seen your parents actually go through the hardships that they have to go through, I think it just gives you a tremendous respect for what we have. I think sometimes I feel uh, uh, that that uh, that appreciation towards the country's vision is missing in several Americans who are born and brought up here, whereas that never goes away from immigrants because we've seen uh, what hardships means like. 
Um, so, Hung, do you think that kind of background motivated you to run? I know you you got into the race much recently than several candidates, but you definitely have groundswell support. Uh, I've seen that from grassroots volunteers, as, although I have not attended your rallies, I've thought about them quite a bit. But do you think your background is the one that kind of motivates people to rally behind you? I don't know if this background more is the, the passion, right? Like you said, it's it's people want somebody that will fight for them. I came in in January uh, after I retired in October. And like you said, watching Kabul fall and just watching us leave Americans behind, American citizens and, and our allies behind. And I had to work hand in hand with people since September to bring out um, these Americans and these other uh, Afghan allies out. So, um, so since September till now, we've brought out 162 people just through our, our old lines of, of uh, all the people we used to work with and, and paying, paying them to, to smuggle out people that, that we owe life debts to. And it's, it's part of honor, but I just think, you know, the same man who caused Kabul to fall is causing Ukraine right now because he, you know, by, by cutting off the XL, uh, the um, pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline and, and making us not energy independent, it paid Putin all the, that money to, uh, it gave Putin all the, the money to, to do what he did in Ukraine. Go back in 2010, when I was in Iraq at the time with, with one of the SEAL teams, we watched as, as uh, he came over as the Vice President of the United States to negotiate the, the uh, Status of Force Agreement, which gives us, um, that gives our troops protection under the law, and he failed to do so. So we had to get kicked out, of, we got kicked out of Iraq at that time, causing ISIS to come about. Now you go back to 1975 as a junior congressman, he voted to not give any more aid to South Vietnam. In fact, he said, we don't owe anything to one or even 100,001 Vietnamese to take them out of there. So this is the same man that caused all four of these conflicts. And I'm telling you right now, this is personal for me. This is personal because this man has blundered everything he's touched and he's gonna destroy our country right now, this country that, that I've fought and bled for, for, for 30 years. Hang, what is impressive with what you said is you, because you kind of lived that world, you're able to articulate what policies that really got the got where we are. I think that's one of the things I tend to tell candidates that stop calling names <laughs> to your opponents, but try to articulate the policies. And I think uh, since you lived that world, you're able to talk about it so well. But Hung, let me let me get your professional background. I know you were accepted to United States Naval Academy in, in Maryland, and upon graduated, you served as a deep sea diver and explosive. Our, um, ordnance disposal officer, very impressive record. And after that, you were also deployed in combat to Iraq. You just spoke about Afghanistan and Somalia, serving alongside special forces and SEAL teams. So you have served our country when our country needs you the most. So there is, again, no doubt that you have so much support. So can you briefly talk about your roles and experience, experiences in these jobs? I truly, truly believe that when you have that kind of experience, it's easy to translate the skills to policy making. So I'm just curious to know about what kind of roles and experiences you had. Yes, ma'am. So obviously I did a lot of combat operations, also humanitarian. I went to Pakistan and, and helped during the 2005 um, earthquake relief. I, I recovered bodies from the bottom of the ocean. But when I was not deployed, I also worked in the Pentagon. One job was do, doing requirements, which looks at the new, new uh, what, what we need for our new Navy. But another one, the last job I did in Pentagon I balanced the Navy's $140 billion budget. So I, I know how to write and balance a budget, which is Congress's main job. We haven't had a balanced budget for 16 years, 16 years of continuing resolution. And that's hurt our industry here. In the 10th district, the largest employer is the government uh, contracting. And every year that we, we do this continuing resolution, it hurts these companies. And people are always thinking, oh, well, you know, those are big, uh, rich companies. They're not, and not, not only that, these companies hire small companies. They're, they're they're subcontractors, and that's the small business that that depend on on the large business um, contracts to to make ends meet. Now, the other another thing I've done is I've written policy. Uh, one time I, I wrote the um, the annex to the treaty between the United States and Mexico for the munitions recovery for all the munitions that wash up on the uh, Mexican shores. I have been to 50, more than fifty countries and lived overseas, and I speak three languages fluently, so I know how to do foreign uh, relations. Also, I've been on, uh, I was assigned to the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force for many years, for four years. 
I stood up a bomb squad in Monterey, California. I worked in uh, with the San Diego Sheriff's Department and uh, San Diego uh, Police, as well as the Harbor Police in San, uh, San Diego and Virginia Beach also. So I know how to do Homeland Security. And, um, you know, obviously I know national defense very well. Uh, my last uh, tour was working against what we call the near peer, peer and near peer competitors. So the Iran, uh, China and, and Russia threats. Um, but honestly, also immigration, right? As an immigrant, I know the, the immigration laws just as well as you do. And, and you know, who, when we go to Costco, what makes you the most aggravated? If someone cuts in line, right? I mean, that, drives you, that would drive you crazy. With long, and so what, what gives anybody the right to cut in line when you and I waited in line and honorably for the right to be citizens, honorably to wait for the right to vote? And that's my problem is that don't talk to me about DACA or Dream Act because I have dreams myself. Tell, tell me how you're going to get in line like the rest of us. I think uh, Hung, I think immigration topic touches me to core too. I, I try to do a lot of working groups or focus groups within our Indian American community. As you know, Indian American community gets affected the most. We have a lot of green cards and a lot of H-1B that are expected to be out of this uh, great nation after six years if you can't uh, get in the line. And getting in the line right now and uh, achieving green card or citizenship is a 20 year deal, uh, which is kind of scary when you have just people coming uh, in as refugee and picking up the citizenship in three years. I think it's it's just not a fair system. And I'm glad I, I didn't see that as an issue on your website, but I'm glad you're talking about it because I think, especially in 10th Congressional District, you'll be surprised how many folks are just out there hanging out, not getting their citizenship for the past 20 years and are just standing in the line. I think you, uh, the simple analogy is Costco, right? It's like- Yes, exactly, like, yes. Don't cut my line, <laughs> that aggravates <laughs> me. <laughs> Yeah. So, Ahang, I know you you, you you also participated in some humanitarian and disaster relief in Pakistan. Is that what you were talking about when you said you did some, uh, some Yes, ma'am. That yes, that and, and recovering uh, bodies from the bottom of the ocean from airline crashes. Yes, uh, but uh, the in, in Pakistan, when, during the 2005 earthquake relief, you know, th those, none of those houses had any rebar, so they just collapsed and, and crushed, and it was hard, heartbreaking. And just watching how um, NATO went in there. So my boss was an American uh, admiral and he was the commander of that NATO force that went in there. And we're able to, to mobilize for the first time the NATO response force for humanitarian action and uh, disaster relief. And I believe that's what we need to do right now in Ukraine as well. Just mobilize the, the HADR, again, humanitarian assistance disaster relief to uh, Poland and put it right on the border so that we can kind of take care of the 2 million displaced persons uh, from Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Hung, I think I'm glad you also talked about the budget. Uh, when I looked at your bio, you did talk about Navy's $140 billion budget. So I had to double check my eyes to make sure <laughs> I was reading, is it B or is it M? But in any case, I think I'm a fiscally very conservative and I'm a mom, I have to balance the budget at home. Uh, I, I feel that we cannot prosper as a nation or we can't continue to prosper as a nation if our government cannot work within the same means, same means like our um, uh, American families have to live within the means. So uh, Hung, I'm just looking at your issues. Um, I always say uh, you can be the best candidates with best background, but your issues have to resonate with our kitchen table issues. One of the issue that um, uh, that resonates with me is uh, education. Uh, Hung, I think the first time I heard you speak was um, at a TJ um, rally that we had in front of the Supreme Court. You were impressive, by the way. And again, it's a passion. I think passion is what is driving things here. You are a proud member of the inaugural graduation team class at Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology. With so much focus on TJ right now for various issues, obvious issues, there's no one better to talk about TJ than than you, and also, but I also want your insights on what changed from then to now in TJ. It's been what, 20 years or how, how long? Oh, 32 years, 32, 32 years, years since okay. we, uh, we graduated from the first class. And again, I don't wanna take and steal the, the thunder. I mean, I didn't do a lot of the work. It's, it's a great Americans like Azra Namani and, and Harry Jackson that did a lot, a lot of this. So I don't want to be the one that says, oh, I, I helped. I didn't do any of this stuff. They did all that hard work because I was still under the Hatch Act uh, because I was still in active duty. So I could not do anything for them. But uh, now that I'm no longer held under the Hatch Act, I, I want to talk about how what amazing school that is. Right. I mean, 
they're, they're trying to bring in equity. And this is what people don't understand. They hear equity and they think the same as equality. Equity, it means equal outcomes. Equality means equal beginnings. We all have the same opportunity at the beginning, but some ch children, or some kids or just human beings are blessed in different ways. Some people are great at sports, right? Um, some people are, are just great at math. Some people are great at science. Some people are very artistic. Uh, and, you know, you, you see me and I'm only blessed in, in good looks, which doesn't help. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to get a reaction from you. No, no, but, you know, we were blessed in different ways. And so all the people that I went to TJ with were just amazing. Just they're just so smart. Um, I mean, half of them you address now as doctor, right? They're either the PhDs or MDs and just amazing Americans who, who've done so many things for this country and they're giving back. And and to, to, to say now, well, you know, uh, let, let's just do a lottery system, bring them in. It doesn't work because not every kid was meant to for STEM. Not every kid was meant to be, to go to college. I mean, some kids are great at, at, with their hands and we need to push more like the vocational schools because uh, I, mean, I, I have some sailors and soldiers, airmen, Marines that work for me that can look at a car engine and it's fixed. You know, I, I don't have that gift, but, you know, but they, they can't do the, they can't do calculus, differential equations and, 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 you know, quantum mechanics. They can't do all that stuff. However, they, they can figure out an engine. And so we have to look at the different kids, their, their gift, but by just shoving in any kid into TJ and expecting them to have, have the same outcome doesn't work because we, we came there with this, this, we're imbued with this uh, by our parents, really the, the, the academic, um, excellence that we, we were taught. Like my parents taught me at a young age that, hey, look, they can take away your money. They can take away your station in life, but they can't take away the knowledge that's in your head. So they pushed education very hard. That was the most important thing for my parents. And so that's why education was so hard. And I go there and I'm, I'm motivated by other people that, were, that had the same upbringing and the same uh, thirst for knowledge. And that's why we went, were good. It wasn't because of all the technology and all the, the the opportunities the school gave us is because we pushed each other. We, the students push each other, the teachers push each other. I mean, one of our, my teachers was the runner up for the space shuttle challenger. So she was supposed to be there. If Krista McAuliffe couldn't have gone, she would have been in that space shuttle that, that blew up in, in uh, 1986. Wow. Right. So it, wow. it's, that's, that's the caliber of teachers we had there. They, a lot of them had PhDs and it's really just people pushing each other. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have problems with fights or anything. We just, we, uh, the only problem we had was kids staying there too late and, and missing their buses. <laughs> yeah, which happens uh, in all the schools, by the way. Yes. But mm -hmm. uh, Hang, I think you have obviously a real life experience with TJ and I can, I think you're absolutely right. You don't have to push everyone to TJ just to, diversify. There are plenty of schools that are good at different stuff that kids should be. I mean, my son did not go to TJ. He's doing fantastically well. My daughter aspires to go hopefully with this um, uh, things that are going on. I hope she gets in. But if not, I, I always say, hey, you can be a valedictorian in another school. It is a okay. And uh, yes. the things that you like. I mean, sometimes I feel you're better off being a big fish in a small pond versus a uh, what's this other way around? I think kids will do great. And that's yes. one thing I say about American kids. America is a land of opportunities. Every kid, if you tap into their potential versus boxing them, they'll do yes. great. They'll do great. So you, that's uh, a great, great point though. Real fast. My no, nephew was a brilliant guy, a kid. He, he has a PhD in electrical engineering and he works at a big company out West. But I, I was asking him to go to TJ too, but he said, well, you know, I can, just like you said, I can be a, a small fish in a big pond or but here i can be a big you know he graduated valedictorian he he was amazing and and just like that you, you could push different ways but the opportunities are all there uh, absolutely hung. you never want to put a, a kid in a school that doesn't thrive i think uh, even even as a careerist i mean you you did i mean i'm sure a lot of people got into service just like the way you got in but some some were overachievers some were underachievers some were mediocre i mean people thrive based on their passions not necessarily based on where they get educated i think uh, that should be the focus and i think that was the focus of america i mean thanks to woke culture it's just changed when i even came came to America, my thought process was meritocracy matters. You work hard, you get somewhere. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly I, I didn't, 
Yep, exactly. So Hanga, uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is something that I was more curious about. You have served obviously multiple nonprofit organizations and gone on mission trips around the world. You said 50 countries, that's pretty amazing. You, but you, or you and your family also established a 501c3, which builds beep, it's a beeping Easter eggs for children with visual impairments. I mean, where did that thought come from? I thought that was extremely innovative. How does this Thoughts manifest. <laughs> so uh, we we did, how do I say? It? It's hard to say anybody invented. It's like who who invented the the um, the the, uh, the the wheel, right? I mean, it's just we we as bomb techs uh, when we uh, when we test each other for for defusing bombs, we have training devices. So if you do it wrong, it'll beep. And somewhere along the line, someone got this idea. Let's let's go ahead and make Easter eggs so the blind children can can audibly hear it. Uh, audibly see it, you know, so they can hear, uh, see with our ears. Uh, and so we started making these and I, I patented the idea. And, and then I also uh, started 501c3, not to make money at all, because we, we started seeing these on eBay and people are selling for $20 each. And this is, I mean, honestly, it costs about $5 to make. And we wanted that the children to have this, to, you know, that wanted to have this. So we, we, I started a, a 501c3. I wanted my to teach my children how to serve others that are less fortunate than themselves, themselves. So we have a 501c3. It's called the Audible uh, Eggs for the Visually Impaired. And we've done it at the White House many years. Unfortunately, this year I got disinvited to the White House. Um, yeah, they didn't, they completely ghosted me. Uh, I was, they called me up. Is that going, because hey, you're hey, running? I mean, what, what yeah, happened? Yes. No, because they, they vetted me and they realized that I was, uh, I had a, you know, I, I would have never done anything political there. I mean, I, you know, it's professionalism, but they, they just cut all communications with me. They had nothing to do with me because I was supposed to go there and present the, uh, the eggs like I, I've done in many years past. And all of a sudden just, it was uh, silence uh, on the net, but it's fine. We do this all over the, uh, all over the country. We, we uh, work with bomb squads across the country and we sit together, we build these eggs and we send them out for children. Right now we're trying to innovate it because uh, if you think about a dozen Easter eggs out there, all beeping the same sound, it's, it actually is overwhelming to the children. So we're trying to put a, pa um, a passive um, infrared or even a, a uh, R R RFID chip um, on their bracelets and like that, when they get closer, it gets louder and louder near the one egg. So we're always, we're trying to always reinvent the egg, I guess, <laughs> no, reinvent the wheel just to make it better. And, yeah. and uh, so that's, that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to, to come up with a, with a chip and, and a sensor, a passive infrared or even an RFID chip that will sense when the child gets closer, it'll get louder for just that egg or else all the eggs will be so loud and, and the kids won't find it. But it's what a wonderful way to, to allow them to, to experience uh, Easter. I mean, this can translate into uh, baseball, right? Because you can have a beeping, beeping egg and then the bat and then using the senses, they can see through hearing where the ball is and they'll, they'll hit the bat or soccer balls that beep. And, um, you know, you have a, 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 a goalpost that with a whole bunch of little beeps around the, the goalpost so they can visually or audibly see the goal, right? Because, again, th their senses are so much more enhanced than ours. So they can, they can map out in their brain where the, where the goalpost is and they can kick the ball that, that way. So, how so TJ education is coming. Uh, TJ education is definitely coming into picture right here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Oh I know. I can only imagine my teachers going, that idiot, he does, how can he possibly, you know, he was asleep half the time in TJ. How can he come up with this stuff? <laughs> no, that's amazing. I always say once you are assigned students, you're, you're assigned student, period, end of the story. I say that about, about my, I'm a healthcare professional by background. I say, once you're in healthcare, you're in healthcare, period. I enjoy it. I mean, I can talk about it for hours. I mean, I love policy. I love patient care. So I think some of those professions, once you're in it, you're in it. It comes yes, out. Yeah, yeah. No matter where. I know. One, for me, it's once a nerd, always a nerd. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I always say that if people are walking, I can do their gait analysis by by a wink. <laughs> That's all I, <laughs> I do. So, uh, Hang in one of the issues that you talked about your concerns about COVID 19 mandates. And, but I think what uh, the question that I really had it, you took it a step further and advocated for off label alternatives. As you know, I'm an Indian American, so I'm pretty much in tune with what's going on in the other part of the world. So, countries like India and even in, in fact certain yeah, African nations have success
successfully combated COVID-19. In spite of having 1.3 billion people in India, I think they use these off-label drug users approved for other diseases and they were able to do it. And uh, President Trump actually advocated for it for a bit. Yes, but it just and they demonized him, right? They demonized, they demonized him. him. Pe people so like Nina and I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that's all right. I think if uh, I, I guess my question is, if you are, let's say, elected congressman, would, uh, would you feel comfortable going ahead with the for uh, going head on with these pharmaceutical companies and those who benefit from their payoffs to control how medicine has been pr practiced for decades? Uh, I know probably by the time you get to Congress, um, uh, COVID is not going to be a hot topic. So I don't want to labor on the discussion of why did we not use the drugs? I always have a mentality. Of, let's look forward. Because what do we learn from that episode that we have next time when pandemic comes around or just any endemic comes around how do pharmaceutical companies how do we want courageous uh, congress people that goes uh, head on with pharmaceutical companies and actually reject their ideas and come up with alternate solutions uh, what do you think i mean uh, is that something that you have been thinking about absolutely so again you you talk you touched a little bit about how in africa they because they use hydroxychloroquine uh, for malaria as a prophylaxis, there's very few deaths. And like you said, the largest state in India has eradicated um, COVID through ivermectin. Let's look at other um, non-label uses. Um, for example, uh, hyper, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. When a diver goes down and come back up, they have they, they can get high, uh, decompression sickness, they can get uh, em gas embolism. So we put them in a recompression chamber and press them down to, to 45 feet, and then we give them pure oxygen, and that breaks out the bubble. What we found from that is that it heals the tissue. So oxygen at that depth, the partial pressure of oxygen actually seeps into your tissues. You don't need the blood to carry the oxygen through the hemoglobin. You actually The, the tissue actually absorbs oxygen. So we proved that in the 60s before PETA and all these, these companies, these people come up. Uh, we took a pig and we drained it of Moses blood. And at death, the pig got up and started running around. Where they, so it's proved that it didn't need the blood to, to stay alive. Um, we, we see this, this uh, use in many things. We, we use it for gangrene or wounds that can't heal, macular degeneration. Uh, we use it for, um, uh, let's see, well, uh, just many uh, burns, burn victims. It helps heal this, the, the tissues. Well, we can use this for traumatic brain injuries. So people that, that get concussions, like soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, who get concussions in, in, in wartime, or even professional football players, you can actually heal the brain. You can see it when you do a PET scan of the brain, the, you'll see the, 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 the areas that are dark from, from um, trauma you'll see it, it starts, the, the, the blood starts flowing in that area again, and, and it's healing the brain. So I've been pushing for years for hyperbaric oxygen therapy for off-label uses. But you know what? They would rather push $200,000 worth of pills on, on soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who came back from, from war, which have side effects of suicidal ideation and everything else. Uh, they'd rather push the, the, the medicine than do you know how much it costs for, for 40 sessions of this? It takes about 40 sessions to do a, a thing. It costs $8,000. Yeah. $8,000 to heal someone's brain uh, from, from tra tra traumatic brain injury. So we have to look at just off-label uses like that, things that, that we never thought about. Uh, because one of my senior chiefs, his wife had deteriorating hip disease, and she was a level three. So she was being wheeled in in a wheelchair. I authorized... Uh, First one session, which is 40, 40, uh, 40 sessions, but we ended up doing two full sessions, which is 80 sessions. She is, she's walking around now, working out, and she's totally fine. Her hip, her hip display, um, not dysplasia, but the, her hip uh, condition has improved. Yes, ma'am. So we have to look at these off-label uses. They just if it works, it works. And and a lot of times it's you have to follow the money trail. When people say no, it's really because they're trying to push something else. Rindisivir that, that Fauci pushes for, for COVID treatments, you know, the nickname is run death is near, right? Because rindisivir, it was used for something else and all the patients died. So they're like, oh, let's not use this. And then he's trying to push the rindisivir for, for a, uh, a treatment for COVID once they, they, they're positive COVID and it's not working. 
Absolutely, Hang. Uh, I think you and I were thinking of the same lines when you were talking. I said, when you see something so not right, just follow the trail and see where the money source is coming from and you know where the problem is coming from. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I, I'm a physical therapist um, by background and we believe uh, in, uh, in non-surgical interventions. Ooh. I mean, there is so much we could be doing non-surgically without actually using the pain medications. and uh, Even massage therapy, right? I mean, you can do massage therapy, a lot of other things that you can do that holistic care absolutely absolutely i think those are the things and that's precisely why i was curious today if, uh, uh, because i just really don't think our congressmen and women right now are pushing back on pharmaceutical companies and say go back and research and see what other alternatives we have for what you're proposing because what you're proposing is putting billions in your pockets it's really not healing america healthcare in a, um, i mean overall health of americans is still not at, at the par so, Hang, let me get back into your little, little bit of focus on your military career. As you know, in our military structure right now, there is so much focus on social programs that takes away from training our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guards. Um, I mean, they were considered to be the best trained forces in this entire world, and I'm sure they still are. But um, when uh, America has never been attacked when it was strong, I mean, it has, uh, uh, we saw the 9-11, but we were able to give it back and get back on our toes right away. Do you think because there is so much shift in focus on everything else, but actually keeping our national security intact, are we more vulnerable for attacks? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, these these generals need to go away and somehow... They, what I would love to do is propose a bill that when you, you put on your second star, you're not allowed to be in a pointed position or, or, a, um, um, or even be, be in one of those uh, general contracting for at least five years. And the reason why is they're always thinking, you know, in their careers, they're always thinking about the next step, right? It's just been programmed. Like even myself, it was hard for me to, to retire because I was on track to do, do great things. And, oh my gosh, maybe I can make Admiral and stuff like that. But we, they're they're so programmed to to hit that next wicket and get that next ring, and if we if we tell them, hey, if you pick, put on the second star, you cannot go this path. You have to choose whether you're going to serve the country or you're going to serve yourself later on, and and that's one of the big problems. A lot of these guys look at because uh, uh, Jim Mattis was able to become Secretary of Defense, and then after that, Lloyd Austin, they're like, oh well, after four stars, I can be Secretary of Def No. No, you should never be. It should be. That's why it's called civilian control of the military. Actually, there's seven years wait for them, but we waived it. We should never waive these things. But for the lower jobs, the uh, deputy undersecretary of defense or the uh, uh, assistant secretary, Navy, no, those jobs, those appointed jobs, they should not be given to, to retiring admirals or generals. And I think that's the beginning of the problem. Now, going back to what you asked about the um, uh, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion training, again, Follow the money trail, right? Look at how much these companies are making. Pump, companies making a lot of money teaching uh, equity, diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion to to uh, large companies as well as the military, uh, and and it's just it's just ridiculous. We, you know, when I train people, I, I commanded the Naval Diving Salvage Training Center. We trained fourteen hundred special operators from all five services, and there's one standard. Why? Because the sea is unforgiving, and things like hardship, adversity war it's indiscriminate it doesn't care who you are it's going to kill you just the same and so we have to train people to the same standard because you know it's not going to say oh, oh well you're a woman or oh, you're a minority we're not going to we're not going to shoot you as, as hard you know it's that's not how the world works and so we need to train we need to train our military to the fullest ability you know and and i can't, again my school had a 75 percent attrition rate that means only 25 percent of the kids made it through because again, it's a special program for a reason. It wasn't, it's not easy. It's not for everyone. Absolutely, Hung. You're, you're kind of right on right there. So Hung, I, I mean, I want to focus on your issues, but I also want to focus on your opponent, Vexton. <laughs> um, I, I was in 10th district, so I followed her extremely closely. I've seen her at various events as Indian Americans we invite our Congress uh, men and women and also delegates and senators to come to our events. So I've seen her speak. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying just because I support uh, conservative candidates, I would say this uh, regardless. Uh, I just 
never got a feeling that she had either the passion for what she was doing or she couldn't articulate. If she had the passion, she couldn't articulate the passion. More than passion, I think I was looking, I'm very objective, just like the way you were talking that jobs are tough. It doesn't discriminate uh, just because you're an Asian or you're a minority. It, it, uh, when the adversity comes along, it all becomes uh, objective. But I've never seen her vocalize um, uh, any policy matters at all. I mean, she talks about how inclusive she is, she wants to. I, I mean, I almost get a feeling that when Democrats take the stage in front of minorities, they want to talk about what they think minorities like to listen. Like, uh, we are very embracing, we love diversity, we love you guys, we love your tea, we love your samosa, we love your attires, we love your colors. And I think um, uh, as immigrants, I think we are over that, right? So um, I want you to tell me what kind of policy differences do you have with Wexton? I mean, have you researched her policies and you're like, you know what, Shri, that really doesn't resonate, resonate well with me and I'm going to go against her on that particular policy. So we had to look at, again, <laughs> goes back to the money trail and everything else. Look at her, how does a junior congresswoman, and she's only been in for four, four plus years, right? How does a junior congresswoman have the most coveted job in Congress, which is the Appropriations Committee? Usually that's saved for somebody very, very senior because, you know, you can write all the rules. You can be all the, the you can be in the House Armed Services Committee, Intelligence Committee. You can write all the National Defense Authorization Acts. But until the appropriators put the money in there, there's no, no, there's no juice to it. And so that's why the Appropriations Committee is so powerful because the appropriators put the money in there. And so, so how did Jennifer Wexton get in there? Because she's a rubber stamp for Nancy Pelosi. You're watching all the stuff. She stays below the line, right? Here's the line. She stays right below it. She didn't say anything bad about nine, uh, January 6th or anything because she knows where she is. So she stays right underneath, just keeps her head down so that she, she can get more money and so she can stay in power. That's all she wants to do. She doesn't say anything controversial. In fact, she hasn't even presented any, any issues whatsoever. She hasn't even showed up for most of the votes. She votes by proxy and, and whatever. And, and, um, and for her... Yeah, or I'll show all the Democrats, they just think, oh, the, the minorities are going to come vote for us. Why? You don't own us, right? In fact, you're going against everything that we we believe in. We came here for freedom. We, be, we came here for uh, um, for equality. We came here for, for opportunity. And we came here, you know, for education and all these things. And they're destroying it. In fact, they're turning this country into what we ran away from, right? I mean, we don't want, I don't want, boys to go and buy daughters bathrooms i don't want i don't want schools to be able to keep away from me that oh your daughter thinks she wants to be a boy and so uh we, we we're just going to start calling her by a boy's name and not tell you like no you know what my bill of rights is it's called a birth certificate it's got my name on it that means i'm the only person that that has the right to that child not you Absolutely. and that's where they overplayed their hands uh this the, all these things are 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 going to go back in their faces. I mean, the, the, uh, like I said, the, just, I, I don't understand where, where their, what their end game is because they're going to destroy this country. And honestly, for me, life is so important and what they're doing, you know, I've never seen, let me go back. I, I've looked at evil in the eyes, right? I mean, in Iraq, I, I interrogated this one bomb maker and, and he was a, uh, a PhD in engineering and he, he was brilliant. And so the FBI said, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're a physicist. Can you come in and talk to this guy and, and see how he did all this, his, the, uh, how he plotted the, and did all the uh, calculations? I'm like, sure. And just looking into his eyes, he killed thousands of people. And he had no remorse. And I saw pure evil in his eyes. But that's the same, that's the same I see in these people. They're so hell-bent on killing a child. Um, you know, they're pushing so hard for abortion. It's like, you know, we're one of five countries that, that allow late term abortions the way it is. I mean, the only other, other ones in North Korea and China. And, and not only that, we are, if you look at California Bill 2223, it allows parents, well, it, it's a loophole that allows parents to kill their child up to 28 days after birth. They don't, they're not held responsible if a child dies after 28 days after birth that wow. that's evil that's pure evil we're going to be judged as a nation as a people for that and i don't want to be on the wrong side of history 
that is just pure evil. That's telling me that that a, a young teen mom that that gave birth and she regrets, you know, she can strangle her child and like, well, you know, the child had pro- complications and she's not held accountable. We are taking accountability away from people, and that's not what immigrants want. None of these, none of us want that. We would never be on the side of of pure evil like that. Hang, that, that's kind of impressive. I mean, there are several things that I was taking a mental note of while you were speaking. As long as I've known Wexton, I thought I read up a lot on uh, policies, but you made a, a, a very good point that I think our viewers have to see. By the way, when we are talking about our viewers, one of the viewers just said that they heard you. She heard you, Robin heard you and WML, and she thinks you're a very strong candidate. So kudos to you. Um, I always say the more comments that we get is when people don't uh, like what they hear, <laughs> but when people like, people are, rela- are really not writing as much, but when people take the time to write, that tells how strong. In fact, one of my colleagues from FCRC sent me about an ad saying that, hey, did you hear Hung's ad in WTOP? Um, it's amazing. And I said, oh, I, I have not, but I should. <laughs> so I think whatever you're putting out there is great. Going back to Wexton, though, I think the thing that you said about appropriate, appropriations committees is such a great point. I think uh, she, you're going to give a run for her money because you really know what policies and where that policy differences are coming from. So um, so, Hung, let's get back to our ethnic groups. I think you touched when you started off on uh, this journey of conversations. Uh, in Congressional District 10, I, for majority of me living in Virginia, I lived in Congressional 10, and I have great circles, tons and tons of Indian Americans and Hindu Americans, that, that, and even some Asians have been very integral part of our Asian communities. Uh, there are about, again, um, 25%, which are 15% folks are Asians, 10% Hispanics, and 7% and Black or African Americans. I mean, that's a, that's a stronghold for minorities. And I, I see Congressional District 10, which shouldn't be no news to you. They speak a non-English language at home as their primary language in 50 or 50% of the households. So I guess my question is any outreach, I know we all know the data right now, but any specific outreach strategy that you or your campaign has formulated to ensure that all of these communities are, are being reached? So the first community I reached out was, you know, you start with the easy one. So my, my, my Vietnamese community has really come around me and, and really supported me. I mean, they're, they're out there knocking on doors every night for me and, and making phone calls. And it's, it's just amazing. I, we, we actually call ourselves Americans with Vietnamese roots. That's when you literally translate how we say it, we're, we're Americans with Vietnamese roots because we love this country. We know what it, it provided us. And, and, you know, no other country in the world can give us this. I mean, Ronald Reagan said this. He said, you can spend a lifetime in, in Germany, in France, or in England, but you'll never be German, you'll never be French, but you'll never, and you'll never be uh, British. But now you'll, they'll let you be a citizen, but they won't call you French, right? But anybody can come to the United States and be an American. And we love that. We love being called Americans. You know, the flag I wear on my shoulder in, in combat is the flag of the United States of America, and I'm proud of it. I bleed red, white, and blue, and I love, I love being an American. Now, uh, I think we all share the same passion in this country. We share that the, our, our, we, we honor our parents with our heritage. You know, I, I, I speak Vietnamese at home with my, my mom and my father just passed away three months ago. Um, you know, we, 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 we do all this to, to honor our parents. We do, you know, all the cultural things. I mean, I love Vietnamese food. Now, how do I reach out to the other organizations? So um, I, I'm, I become very good friends with uh, uh, Shi Van Tleet. She's a huge outspeaker against uh, socialism and Marxism. And so she's, she's brought me into a lot of the, um, the uh, Chinese American groups, as well as, uh, you know, Azra Namani, as you know, you know, brought us in and, and so I can understand better the Indian community. Now, again, in my, at Thomas Jefferson, there was a lot of, of Indian Americans in fact, one of them became a, uh, my classmate became a cardiologist who took care of my father for last uh, uh, 10 years. So uh, Raj Garg is, is a, f- a fantastic physician, a cardiologist who took care of my dad for 10 years. So, you know, it's, it's just a that's, that's special thing. I've, I've had friends in the Indian community who are in the intelligence community right now, and, and we talk to each other all the time. Um, the Iranian Americans, uh, the, the ones who fled during the fall of the Shah, and they, they're part of what's called the American Middle East. Coalition for uh, Democracy have backed me and and followed uh, you know and and come behind me and then the Korean American because I I did a lot of the uh, I spent a lot of time doing taekwondo growing up and, and as a kickboxer and everything else 
you know, and getting into those communities. But what I want to do is, is, is make sure these communities know that we've been sold a bag of goods by, by the Democrats that keep saying, oh, they're, uh, the Republicans are racist or they're, 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 um, they, they, they hate minorities. Like, I, I've never felt hate. I mean, look at what we've achieved. Like, I went to TJ. I went to the United States Naval Academy. I have a master's in physics from uh, the Naval Postgraduate School. I went to Harvard. I went to MIT. I'm a Navy captain in special ops. Please tell me where I was discriminated against. And that's what they try to do, right? They try to break us apart in these little groups when all we want is to come together. Our, our country's motto is e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And we try to assimilate and we try to be part of the group. I mean, look at you're running the FCRC, you know, you're, you're part of the FCRC and, and doing a, a show and you're, you, you know, and your background is Indian American. I'm running for Congress and I'm a, I'm a Vietnamese American. And so this is how wonderful of a country this is that we're able to come here and, and, and with our background and push this country forward even further. And I have not seen one uh, non, um, uh, I mean, non Indian American candidate talk about all these races so eloquently. So kudos to you. You learned a lot. Either you had a prior experience. I, I don't think you learned all of this in three months and you're regurgitating. I think you just had a background of being in a very diversity environment. Now, I, it's nice to see that you focused on Ira Iranian Americans. I think a lot of us focus on Asians, uh, Hispanics, Black, and we forget our Middle Eastern. Uh, uh, counterparts. And I think it's extremely important. As much as we don't want to play race politics, we also need to understand each community because each community is our monolithic. And I'm glad you pointed out saying that I'm part of FCRC. I always laugh to people and say, where, where is the racism coming from? I have an accent <laughs> and I'm <laughs> yes. able to do so much more than uh, what you think I should be doing. I, I think it is just a matter of uh, be racism is everywhere, Hung. I mean, I go to India, yes. I see that. <laughs> yes, I wrote, I wrote an article a long time ago that said, yeah. you know, we've hated, man has hated each other since the first generation human beings, right? And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm Christian, so I'm, I'm you know, in, in my Bible, it says that, you know, Cain murdered Abel because he was jealous of him. And then growing up in, uh, in, in Vietnam, you know, the, the Vietnamese didn't like the Chinese, the Chinese didn't like the Japanese for what happened, you know, and then I grew up in Africa. Uh, in Niger, they hated the Tuaregs because of the um, the nomadic tribe they went across there. In Madagascar, they hated the Indians because the Indian shop owners, you know, own all the shops. I mean, and the Greeks hate the Turks. The Turks hate the Greeks. Uh, and, you know, nobody liked the Italians because, uh, you know, these uh, um, Churchill said, you know, it's only fair that the Nazis get them this time because we had them last, last time in the war. So, you know, we'll always look for ways to hate each other. Heck, you put people in, in a room, like even military people, they're like, oh, you're an Air Force guy. Oh, you're a Marine, you know. But if we can look at things that bring us together, and that's being an American, I think that's what's, that's our commonality. You know, we, we, we can have differences, but as long as we can say that, hey, do you love this country? Because I love this country. Can we, if we can start with that, I think we can go a lot further than, than just looking for things that make us different, but looking for things that bring us together. And whatever you speak, you're giving me a lot of pleasure and joy. I think these are the conservative values that we need to focus on. Uh, there, is there racism? I'm sure it is, but uh, show me a country where there is no racism. Why are you picking an America? This is the greatest nation. It has given in numer I mean, numerous opportunities to all of us. So don't pick on the things that uh, you just want to nitpick on a great nation such as this. And Hung, just so you know, she was on my show yesterday. She's oh, is she? She's here. awesome. She is awesome. And she spoke so eloquently about communism, just like the way I started off with you asking about uh, Saigon Fall. I wanted to talk to her about American, sorry, Chinese Cultural Revolution and the parallels that she's able to draw with the American uh, revolution that's going on right now. I think, um, and I think one of the things that she said uh, kind of resonates with me. She's like, Shri, the, um, and this was after the conversations, I hope she doesn't mind me saying about it. She said, Shri, immigrants are here, we are patriotic and we are gonna save this country. And I think when I see such patriotic immigrants like you, I feel like, you yeah, probably she's right. Probably this is going to be a nation. It was always a nation of people melting pot. And we just really, as immigrants, we have to step up and say, you know what, we own this country country. We are not just going to use their resources. Um, uh, we are going to be integrated to 
its core. Uh, um, America's problems are our problems. America's pleasures are our pleasures. America's opportunities are our pleasure, our opportunities. So let's work this together. This is quite uh, uh, quite a nice thing for me to hear. Uh, Han, you briefly mentioned about American Middies Coalition for Democracy. I know you have some great endorsement. I'm not going to just read out the endorsements, but I'm curious to know what is American Middies Coalition for Democracy? Is they that are, what you're talking about Iran? You see the Iranian, yes, the Iranian uh, Americans who, who fled during Shah, they, 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 they hate the authoritarian regimes of the, the Ayatollah and, and what it's doing to destroy the, uh, the country of Iran. Remember that before the Shah fell, I mean, Iran was the, the Mecca of just it was really the, the place of innovation. A lot, of, uh, a lot of schools of technology were there. The Shah really embraced Western culture and, and, and made just Iran this, this, this amazing place in the Middle East. And then the Ayatollah came in and put everybody, you know, women were not allowed to go to school. Uh, um, it's, just, it's just painful to watch what they did, did to, to Iran uh, from just really from, from their, 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 their belief system. Um, and it's, it's about, you know, it's about suppression. And so the, the uh, American Middle East uh, Coalition for Democracy wants to, to ensure, you know, just really educate people on that the Iranian people are not the problem, it's the regime. Just like we don't hate China, we're hating the, the CCP for what it does. I mean, it's all the same thing. You call it Marxism, communism, uh, uh, socialism, equity, you know, authoritarian, it's all the same thing. It's about keeping everybody down and, and allowing the, the, the top guys, you know, to, to, to flourish. I mean, you know, Xi, Xi Jinping has a, doesn't look like he's lost a, a day, a meal in a day, just like Kim Jong-un has, hasn't missed a meal either, you know? And, and so we need to, we need to, to let people know that the evils of some of those regimes and what they're doing, uh, the Iranians are, are doing a lot of things in the Middle East. They're, they're uh, arming the Houthis. They are doing illicit oil transfers and going down to Venezuela and giving off that oil, and then they're trading for missile parts so they can shoot it at uh, uh, Israel. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting American Medis Coalition. I think sometimes we crave for um, endorsement from people that we think uh, are kind of popular. But sometimes I say, um, uh, you know what, that may not resonate with the kitchen table uh, issues. Uh, uh, so I said, go into these communities that have never been heard. And also communities, um, uh, these kind of coalitions that have a lot of integrity and purpose to why they established these coalitions and get their buy-in because uh, uh, their values and our values match a lot. So I'm glad you reached out too, because I run Excellent. an outreach and minority coalition, and I'm always looking for organizations that not only resonate, but has the value and integrity and patriotism towards this country. Those are the people that I really want in my bucket. I don't want any woke leftists. <laughs> no, no, yeah. yeah. Um, because want, I can't change their mind. I, I, no. I don't want to waste change time uh, ch trying to change their mind. It's just very challenging. So Hung, as we are coming to the end, I don't want to, I know you have um, a lot of, as a campaign uh, when you're actively campaigning, I don't want to keep you past any of your time, but uh, I mean, you're a very strong candidate. Uh, so are, there are several other candidates that are uh, strong too. So what, you don't have to give me your strategic uh, executive plan by any means, but I was just curious to know what are, what is your strategy for winning primaries? Because you can only do great things if you win primaries. <laughs> Yes. So, so the first thing we had to do was uh, get a um, get a lot of money right off the bat, because without money, I can't I can't campaign. Right. And, and people are like, what do you know all the money? Every time you get something in the mail, that's at least a dollar. Now, some people, they have very extravagant ones with three folds. That's like now two, three dollars. So every time you get something in the mail is one dollar. And with a, a district with nine hundred thousand people, you know, that's almost a million dollars. So you have to be targeted. So you have a target, uh, a team that that targets the right uh, demographics, right? Households that would actually go vote. Uh, the uh, and you you mentioned WMOL, the the uh, radio ads as well as the TV ads on Fox News, Fox Business. Uh, we're hitting HGTV soon. Uh, my wife is uh, has another commercial. My third commercial has my wife because I think it'll resonate better with the the women in this area. But it, it talks about education because she homeschools our, all our kids. So that's our 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 goal for for. Uh, winning the, the, uh, the selection and as well as go, going out there outreach. But really at the end of the day, Americans just want somebody that will fight for them, right? We, we believe in power, we believe in passion, we believe in someone, we just want somebody to fight for us. I fought 
in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. I've been to Pakistan. I've been under, under the ocean. I've done everything this country's asked me to do. In fact, you know, I sacrifice a lot for this. My, I left my wife uh, when she was nine, eight months pregnant with my, my first child. We were invaded in Iraq. And, and honestly, we were expecting 40% casualties. I didn't think I would, I didn't think I would live. Like there was a good chance I would be killed in, in combat. And so I had to write my son notes that says, son, you're 10 years old now, um, you know, double digits, son, you're 16 years old. You're about to have the, the uh, responsibility of driving a car. You need to take that responsibility, you know, heavily. And, and son, you're 18 years old. You're a man now. You're, you're about to step out into the world. But these are things I did because I believe so much in this country. I, I believe that that I believe in so much that I was willing to fight and die for it because I did not want my son to wake up one day without a flag to stand under or a country call it his own, like, like what happened to me. So it's the sacrifice that's important and Americans just want somebody to fight for them. I'm going in there with a coalition of 42 other people that I fought in combat with. So these are Green Berets and SEALs. Uh, we're part of what's called SEAL Pack. And we're going in there as, as a force. We're of 20% of the Republican voice that can say, no, you're not going to you're not going to destroy the Constitution that we fought to save. If you're a rhino, then get out of our way. Uh, but we're we're not we're going to be heard from and we're going to preserve and protect this Constitution like we have been for 30 years of our lives. And, and that's what's going to be resonating to the American people that they want somebody to fight for them. Well, I'm going to fight for you. And if I'm willing to put my life online for our values, what do you think I'm going to do for this district where I live, where my wife volunteers as the EMT? where my, my kids go to church and where my friends own businesses. There's nothing I wouldn't do for, for where we live. Absolutely, Hung. When you were saying that you were putting notes for your kids, it just gave me little goosebumps. And these are the kids that uh, our school district calls them privileged. It just, it just, it's just mind blowing to me that how could you, because they didn't know whether their mom or dad is even going to come back home to them. And you call these kids a privilege. I don't, I don't get it. I think they're privileged to serve, to be in this great nation, to be born to a, a military family. I think that's a privilege, but not necessarily to live their life because there is so much uncertainty. So I always say for those people that do that, I say, shame on you. You guys need to respect these kids and be very empathetic to what they have to go through day in and day out while mom and dad are out serving the nation. So uh, Hung, we are, uh, we are in the last two minutes. I do want you to take some time and appeal to your voters. You can tell about their website, any volunteer information or primary information, and also anything that I missed. I always say that I try to pack up the show, uh, uh, trying to understand your issues very well and what our viewers' issues are, but I might have missed anything. So this would be a good time <laughs> okay. to go. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, I think we covered everything. I mean, my, my, my website's written on there, hungcalforcongress.com. You can find out... Um, there's a calendar on there that allows you to go uh, to see where we'll be appearing next. Uh, there's on the 20th, I would love to invite you to our, um, our rally. We have a rally down in uh, the farm brewery down in Haymarket. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got one of my, my friends owns about a hundred uh, bouncy houses. He owns a business. So we'll have bouncy, bouncy houses for all kids, maybe one for adults. I don't know, but no, I'll pl uh, spray pledge all over it. So we'll slip around, <laughs> but uh, we're catering that with, um, with uh, Mission Barbecue. So please come on by and, and enjoy our time. And it's the night before the, the, the vote and I'm gonna bring a lot of heavy hitters to speak for us. Um, but again, it's just a privilege to serve and, and I, the, my calling's not over yet. You know, I, I thought I could hang up my uniform and just fade away, but um, you know, they're attacking our country from the inside and I, I will not stand for it. And so, you know, um, you know, you know, I fought for you. I, I'm not gonna stop fighting for you. Hung. I probably will join the party myself. I'm, I'm starting to make a note of that. <laughs> so uh, first thing, Hung, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an utmost pleasure, not only to understand your background in detail, but also to everybody talked about your passion. I personally <laughs> had not been other than one rally that I was part of where you got a chance to speak with uh, for a few minutes. But I think uh, I understand where you're coming from. I, I think as an immigrant, I'm very proud of you. Your parents should be extremely proud of you for 
for raising a, a kid that not only wants to give life to the nation, but wants to continue to be in the game because a lot of people uh, decide to fade away, which I don't think is wrong, but I think wanting having the grit to stay around and work equally hard, if not more, is uh, quite admirable. I thank you for serving our nation and I look forward to your leadership in Congress. Um, hopefully this will pan out for you. Uh, you have a wonderful weekend, Hung. Hope to see you and happy campaigning. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Viewers, you've saw, seen again, Hung Kao, Captain Kao is running for 10th Congressional District. He is one of the candidates. Uh, I, I believe they have about 11 candidates. Please visit 10th Congressional District website, hungkaoforcongress.com to learn about other candidates and, say, and learn about Hung, uh, Captain Kao as well. Let's all join together and we can take control of House of Representatives and change the tide that has swept our nation this past year. This hasn't been great years for us. Looking forward to seeing you all in the future. In the next coming weeks, we will have here at Christine, he's running for 8th Congressional District and also another candidate from 10th District, John Henley. I hope you will continue to tune in. Information will be posted on Facebook page. Please keep an eye out and uh, tune in for all of these conversations. Thank you all for sitting and tuning in and listening to us. God bless you and your families. God bless Hank. Uh, he has five kids. <laughs> it's <laughs> always amazing <laughs> to kind of see how our beautiful American families are growing. It just gives me immense pleasure to see the kids that are growing with values and integrity. God bless all the children out there and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you.